All right, we're going to look at the arguably the 20th century's greatest English language poet, William Butler Yeats. Uh, I say that he's one of the 20th century's greatest poets, but he was actually born in 1865 and dies at the onset of the Second World War in 1939. <clears throat> uh, Yeats began uh, as a very interesting figure. He's born to a Protestant uh, family, a middle-class Protestant family. His <clears throat> father was a very cosmopolitan man, uh, moved uh, from the legal profession to uh, be a painter and inherited a fortune, uh, which he allowed him to do that, which he unfortunately mostly evaporated. Uh, the father's influence on the son was um, difficult to assess. He did uh, himself explore being a painter for a time and was uh, very much attracted by the pre-Raphaelite school of painting, uh, which uh, is a sort of very sensuous representative style uh, full of concrete details, which uh, they argued uh, were lost once uh, Raphael and the uh, Renaissance began. Uh, and uh, the pre-Raphaelites in their painting sought to uh, capture a, a very uh, supernatural, um, in many ways, uh, luminous beauty. If you look at the paintings, it's very evocative and uh, very uh, erotic and elusive in its imagery. Uh, we've already looked at uh, some of that in connection with the Lady of Shalott, but that sort of uh, focus on, an, an, on a luminous supernatural beauty uh, was very much uh, part of uh, Yeats's uh, tastes, even as a, as a poet. Uh, eventually he gave up painting for poetry <coughs> and uh, spent a uh, fair bit of time in his youth going back and forth between Ireland and, and England and was really a part of both literary establishments. Um, he didn't devote himself fully to literature till 1886, so he's uh, 21 at that age. Uh, and uh, in 1887, uh, shortly after he decided to become a poet, he became he came under the influence of a woman by the name of Madame Blavatsky, who's a Russian interpreter, uh, very much of a mystical figure herself, uh, with a very mystical philosophy uh, called Theosophy, uh, which is uh, of uh, interest uh, in terms of its influence on many uh, uh, European intellectuals. Uh, but she preached the doctrine of a universal oversoul. So, uh, uh, individual uh, evolution through cycles of reincarnation uh, and the world in conflict uh, sort of a forces of good and evil uh, and so forth and Yeats was attracted to this for a while uh, but he wanted to he, uh, being a skeptic uh, religious skeptic because of his father's influence uh, he wanted to test this hypothesis out and he was thrown out of the, the theosophist's order uh, and uh, found a a better ally in, in William Blake. Uh, and, and it's probably to Blake that he owes uh, something that he himself has, which is very much of a private mythology. So the, uh, uh, the mysticism that Yeats has from this uh, dalliance with Blavatsky uh, was also there in Yeats, and it never really disappeared, quite frankly. Uh, so uh, Yeats is a very interesting figure and, uh, and somewhat hard to uh, place in the context of, of other eras as well. He wanted to create an Irish national literature uh, that made Ireland beautiful uh, in the memory of its people uh, and, and would free them from the sort of provincialism of being a, a vassal state of the English. So. Uh, at, at one stage early on, he was very much of an Irish nationalist writer. And uh, as he grew older, he, he uh, cooled on that. By the time he was in his middle age, uh, he had uh, cooled on that prospect. But, <clears throat> uh, and, and so just in a poem just before the First World War broke out in 1914, he claimed uh, that uh, Ireland's dead, romantic Ireland's dead and gone. 
So he'd given up more or less, less on the idea of an Irish nation state. Uh, interestingly, not long thereafter, um, there in Easter 1916, there was an uprising, a political uprising against British rule, and the British suppressed it brutally. Uh, the context of the, of the war meant that there, they, the, the British were fearful of a, a second front being opened up on their rear, and they su brutally suppressed it. And 16 leaders were shot <coughs> for, uh, for treason. And uh, the first poem we're going to look at will uh, express Yeats's view on this. And it becomes very much of a, an Irish national uh, poem, uh, almost a, a declaration as such, even though the Irish nation as such does not arise for a few years yet. So it's prophetic uh, in, in a sense. Um, <clears throat> um, politics uh, uh, does become a part of his language in this poem, and I'll, I'll read and discuss that poem before moving on to some of the others. But I should mention some of the figures that are at least alluded to here, although not spoken of explicitly. Um, one of them is uh, uh, the, the beauty to which he refers is Maud Gunn, uh, a woman that he uh, adored and uh, who ended up marrying another man who, whom he calls a vain, a drunken, vain, glorious lout. His name was uh, Major John McBride. <coughs> um, and, and yet McBride died in that, uh, in that uh, uh, shooting. And so he becomes apothesized in in um, in the poem, and I'm going to read the poem, and then I'll comment on its substance. So let me begin with that. So Easter 1916. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among gray 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite, meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said polite, meaningless words, and thought before I had gone of a mocking tale, done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where Motley is born. All changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when, young and beautiful, she rode to Harriers? <clears throat> this man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man, I had dreamt a drunken, vain, glorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. Yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse plashes within it. The long legged moor hens dive and hens to moorcocks call. Minute to minute they live, the stones in the midst of all. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part. Our part to murmur name upon name, as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? N no, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream, enough to know they dreamed and are dead. <clears throat> 
And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. So this magnificent poem, um, famous uh, because of its association, uh, a prophetic evocation of an, of an Ireland, Ireland uh, which has not yet uh, been born when he writes it. This was published in 1916, uh, very much of a, uh, written from an aesthetic point of view uh, of, a, of a beauty and of others who have been transformed into martyrs of sorts, signs of the nation state about to be born. So this, uh, the Easter rebellion, uh, as it was called, uh, was led by radicals whose politics, quite frankly, he disapproved of. And yet he noticed that, he noted that this would have a transformative effect that would not be forgotten. So let me analyze the poem a bit here. It, it falls into uh, four stanzas. Uh, it has a fairly regular cadence to it. Um, I am a tetrameter, uh, more or less, with some variations in it. Um, it does have some uh, a rhyme scheme to it. So day and faces and gray and houses and head and words and said and words and done and jive and companion and club and I and worn and utterly and born. So it, it alternating rhyme and uh, what's noticeable in it, we don't want to uh, pay too much attention to that sort of thing. Uh, what's more noticeable to me is the repetition in it and, and the vivid imagery uh, where we were given a, a, a visual image of sorts uh, repeatedly. Uh, but there's also parallelism in the poet. So it begins um, with a, a, a point of recognition. These are not things, although he's writing about them from, from a distance, he knows the participants of the poem personally. Uh, I have met them, he said, at close of day, coming with vivid faces, and they're coming from the midst of gray uh, 18th century houses, the 18th century, a time of, um, this would be in, in Dublin where they were under English rule uh, and there's a great deal of uh, disparity of wealth between the Protestants and Catholics there as well. And there's a, something of a routine going on and he's nodded and they've made polite, meaningless words and they thought at the first stanza suggests that this is a place of, of folly and futility and a vain repetition. So the city is gray and the words are polite and meaningless and thought that uh, the, uh, his countrymen were fools of sorts where, where Motley uh, is worn. Uh, and yet the final two lines of the poem, uh, which are repeated uh, elsewhere, uh, and with some variation, all changed, change utterly, a terrible beauty is born, uh, which he repeats uh, at the end of the second line, with a uh, second stanza with some variation, transformed utterly, a terrible beauty is born before it. And then uh, the third uh, varies and re a vague reference to a stone in the midst of all, uh, but the final stanza repeats all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. So a strong sense of closure and repetition uh, and parallelism between the stanzas. But uh, there's another significant change uh, from the first stanza where uh, the denizens of Dublin, uh, he had thought would be wearing where motley is worn, that is the, the garb of the of the fool and yet by the end, now and in time to be wherever green is worn are changed. So now their names at first, they were anonymous. They were just vivid faces coming from behind gray counters. By the end of the poem, they have names that have been uh, made uh, names of memory uh, in Irish history and a sort of prophecy of a birth. But let me go through some, just some of the other images along the way. But those, 
though that, that beginning and those structures seem to particularly um, add uh, uh, beauty uh, to the poem and um, and make it memorable. Uh, the uh, the second stanza begins with a, a reference to a woman. Now the the reference to the woman is not clear to the to the reader, um, although he says he knows who these people are. Uh, for our part, we're given nothing but vague references. It seems of personal interest and importance to the reader, or to the writer rather, the poet, but of none to the uh, audience per se, which makes it more striking when they do. Uh, finally get names at the end and, and the transfer from being anonymous to having names and not just names but names of that will be memorialized is part of the shocking and terrific terrible beauty of the poem so that woman's days were spent in ignorant uh, ill will and references to these uh, various uh, characters whom he will name at the end uh, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce are alluded to here, to here in the second stanza, although that woman is not mentioned, namely Maud Gunn, uh, the uh, wife of McBride. Uh, but he is mentioned here, as I say, or alluded to in the language of being a drunken, vain, glorious lout. Uh, Yeats was a bit envious, I think. Um, the third stanza shifts uh, to some, again, vague references of symbolic significance. Uh, there are, are images with uh, terrific um, sound quality, uh, evocative as such. I remember this poem being read to me in the third grade by, uh, I think, an Irish uh, teacher. Um, her name was Mrs. Luna. Um, and I remember her delighting in the sound of the poem, which uh, didn't really mean much to me in the third grade. But I, having said that, I remembered it because she uh, drew my attention to it. The horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse plashes within it. And the long leg moor hens dive and hens to moorcocks call. I'm not sure if these have any symbolic significance or not. I'm not a Yeatsian scholar. Um, to me, they're more visual images of the Irish landscape. And yet it begins uh, in the third line of the third stanza with a reference uh, that hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. Uh, there's a sort of a movement, uh, a, a slow movement that a, a stone can make and it has a ripple effect. And then there's this a cascading series of images along here. And then in the midst of all that, Again, a reference to the stone in the midst of all. Um, again, is it the stone that disturbs the water and the, the circles of the, of the uh, uh, from the splash of the stone into the water ripple out in the same way that the national identity of Ireland about to be born will ripple out? Perhaps that's alluded to as well. But he, he, he holds on to that image of a stone and he, he transforms it and makes it metaphorical. Too long a sacrifice in the fourth stanza, he says, can make a stone of the heart. This is biblical imagery. Um, God says that he will remove our stony hearts and gives us a heart of flesh. Uh, too long a sacrifice reference here, perhaps, to um, the desire for an Irish nation, which had repeatedly failed. Remember the Brit uh, Irish, as I believe I mentioned when I talked about Milton's Paradise Lost, had been subjugated by Oliver Cromwell uh, to ward off the possibility of uh, rebellion from the Catholics there. And he'd left a garrison of English aristocrats that's, that remain there all through uh, the eras of Jonathan Swift and on to the present. But too long a sac sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice that? The answer to that question, in other words, is heaven's part, our part, to murmur name upon name, as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that run wild. So there's a, a sort of a, 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 a metaphorical and transformative aesthetic and universal uh, 
uh, image here, which will evoke the the significance of this particular moment. There are only 16, 16 uh, people who died in this, but the 16 people for uh, Yates not only takes place on Easter 1916, of course, the Easter um, festival itself celebrates the resurrection. And here there's a, and, and with that new life. And so the stone that has been removed from the start is like the gravestone that's been rolled away. And of course, within that, there's nothing because he is risen. All of these things are evoked by Yeats in the poem uh, and the child who's now run wild. But what is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? Good Friday has led to the death. And now how about the resurrection for England? He says, may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? They died out of love. Again, uh, allusions here of the sacrifice of the lives and the Easter rebellion with a resurrection of a, an Irish na nationalism. And his, his place our part is to murmur name upon name, he says. And so now he does do that exactly at, uh, in the conclusion of the poem. I write out in a verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, wherever green is worn are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. So these words, uh, prophetic words, uh, political words, uh, when he writes them, and potentially seditious words, uh, are now memorialized and beloved by um, the uh, Republic of Ireland. Um, uh, for that matter, when, uh, when Irish nationalism does take place, um, just after he's written two years before, as I said, that that romantic Ireland is dead and gone. Um, he creates this mythic framework uh, prophesying the future Irish nation state. And um, when the uh, First World War comes to a close, there's a, uh, an Anglo-Irish war in 1919 to 1921, uh, and then finally followed by a civil war uh, of great violence, uh, a terrible beauty uh, and the birth of the Irish nation state. And in the Irish free state, Yeats is made into a senator for uh, six years. Uh, and in the midst of that, 1924 is given the Nobel Prize uh, for literature. Um, uh, second poem uh, I would like to look at uh, is uh, The Second Coming. Now, The Second Coming is uh, in many ways uh, rather different than uh, the other poem and in other ways uh, quite similar. Um, so whereas early on in his poetic um, corpus, Yeats says poems is, is very public and straightforward in its symbol symbolism. He often has references to the, to the rose for Ireland and so forth. Uh, later on, his symbols, like in this poem, become more more elusive and more, um, again, part of a private mythology and very difficult, uh, uh, recondite, very difficult to actually uh, understand. <laughs> so there, there's a reference to a to the gyre of a of a falcon, which is associated uh, with uh, the the march of history in some ways, or the spiral, the circular unfolding of history. Uh, remember that in the classical world, history was seen as having a, a cyclical, uh, there would be a golden, uh, silver, a bronze, and an iron age, and then a return to a golden age. So there was the eternal recurrence. There was no pro notion of progress. Come Christianity, uh, history takes on a, a linear uh, sense that uh, history began uh, with God's creation. Uh, it, it's marked by... Uh, the uh, death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, and then in his second coming, there will be an end uh, to human history and a new heavens and a new earth, uh, restoration of all things that have fallen. But there's a sense of a progress towards that eschaton, that, that last um, uh, 
God-ordained aim for all of human history. Well, here he presents it not in such ways, uh, but more in the sense, again, of a, of a cyclical, uh, mythological sense, uh, more of a pagan view of history. Uh, and, and the figure that he portrays here, this uh, vast image out of Spiritus Mundi, the world spirit, um, I don't think he gets this from Blavatsky, but uh, it does sound rather theosophical. Uh, I might be wrong about the source here, but I'll read the poem and then I'll say a bit more. So once again, this is written uh, in 1921, so five years after the previous uh, poem that we read. So the second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all around about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, it's our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So again, the uh, context here is very Christian imagery. Uh, the second coming, uh, obvious allusions to the second coming of Christ, but of course that is the end of all things. And uh, in uh, Christian understanding, the second coming of Christ will not be as the first was uh, to atone for mankind's sin, but rather to judge the earth uh, for those who have um, uh, uh, sought to thwart him and have railed against his righteous rule. And for those who have bowed the knee uh, and uh, worshipped him, there will be a judgment, a uh, final judgment. And that sense here of the second coming uh, has that sense of doom and gloom of, of judgment uh, that will come. But as I say, it doesn't begin uh, with the, a sense of a linear progression towards that or even a birth, um, but rather with the image of a widening gyre of a falcon. Now, a falcon, uh, when, it, when it's unhooded, a falcon's a hunting bird for the aristocrats. When you remove its, its uh, hood, it and throw it into the air, it, go, it goes up and it goes up and it spirals up and up and then it, uh, its eyesight is so keen it can see um, prey from a great height and then it stoops and plummets at a great uh, speed. So the fastest uh, uh, bird of all, uh, the falcon. But here the falcon is not portrayed as falling, it's simply going further, it's stooping and stooping and going further and further up in this gyre so far that it no longer can hear uh, the falcon or calling to it. Um, because of the uh, image of the second coming, I think it's fair to imagine the falconer as, as God and uh, the falcon as uh, the people of the earth moving further and further away. And as a consequence in the third line, he says things fall apart. And the center, which is at the center of the gyre, cannot hold. And mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed in every more where the ceremony of innocence is drowned. We'll think of the context of the poem. This is 1921. There had just been a four-year world war in which the European powers threw themselves at one another, believing on, uh, I think, on in each case that the war would be short and sweet and glorious for the nation state uh, involved and instead it was a war of attrition a bloody trench war that claimed uh, countless lives and uh, with it uh, 
anarchy was loosed on the bo- world, which is interesting because uh, Yeats would have been aware of Matthew Arnold's uh, uh, great work, um, Civilization and Anarchy. And um, uh, the anarchy here, which has been loosed, uh, was loosed because the classical uh, belief and the belief in progress and modernity had died on the on the battlefields of the First World War uh, in Belgium, uh, by and large. Uh, and um, symbols of modern progress, like the Titanic, had sunk to the deep. So all of the optimism with which the 19th century concluded had now given away to terrific disappointment and widespread disenchantment, not to mention the loss of countless uh, human lives. And, uh, and violence and extremism had uh, taken its place. Uh, and as I say, Yates himself uh, was not in favor of that sort of uh, uh, rough and tumble democratic politics. He was more of an aristocrat in his, in his uh life and and really was not interested in the rough and tumble of the uh of that sort of uh explicit political involvement he was more interested in representing it uh personally in inside of his mystical view of history but i think you can see in the first stanza um, a a description of a, a world where uh reason has been abandoned and civilization with it and passions are uh, coming to the fore and the people that are most convicted are those that you would least like to have <laughs> convictions and those that ought to have convictions namely the aristocrats are decadent and powerless and all of this uh, is a token of some revelation says yates surely some revelation is at hand uh, Apocalypse is the word that would be used in the book of Revelation, but here it's surely the second coming. But when, as soon as he utters that, he doesn't have a biblical image of, of a bride and a bridegroom, but rather, um, again, this recondite image uh, taken from um, an unknown source uh, of a spiritus mundi troubling his sight in the in the guise of a, of a phoenix, if you recall from last semester in our look at uh, Oedipus the king, uh, one of the riddles uh, that uh, had plagued Thebes uh, was given by a phoenix who plagued the cities and was destroying it. Uh, and he, he being Oedipus, solved the riddle of the, uh, of the phoenix uh, by answering the question, uh, what goes on four legs in the morning, two at noon and three in the evening? And the answer is uh, a man and the phoenix then was destroyed in this. Here we have the same riddle and the same sense of a curse coming with the phoenix, uh, pitiless in its gaze, uh, pitiless as the sun about to destroy and moving towards them, a sense of, of doom and disaster, moving its slow thighs while all about it, real shadows of the indignant desert birds probably crying out because of the uh, of the dead that have fallen and the injustice and the darkness drops with it. But he concludes with um, a puzzling phrase, obviously in its first conception, the first coming of Christ is in the birth at Bethlehem. Here we have a second coming and it's seen as a birth. Whereas in scripture, Christ is portrayed to be, when he comes, he will return on the clouds to judge uh, not he will not be born again in the form of a uh, a child that will need to be nurtured he will come as an a man and as god uh, with uh, the uh, judgment of justice for those who have uh, as i said either worshipped him or have rebelled against him uh, but yates portrays it instead in terms of a birth and perhaps again he's thinking of uh, the Irish nation state, it's unclear. But he says, but now I know that 20 centuries, obviously referring backwards to the birth of Christ, 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, the shaking of all things that can be shaken. And he concludes with a question, uh, which he does not answer. And what 
rough beast. Its hour, come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. And there's a sense of the beast here uh, being given a, a symbolic portrait as uh, the uh, Sphinx, uh, maybe the, and the answer to the riddle may be Christ now. So apocalyptic imagery, famous, famous poem. Uh, but the lines that uh, things fall apart and the center cannot hold, this was the uh, description of a novel by the Nigerian novelist Chinua Chebi, who was critical, as I said, of uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Uh, it's a famous poem by a uh, duly famous poet. Um, I'm going to look at one last poem, uh, a poem that was written uh, five years after this yet again. So 10 years uh, uh, divide Easter 1916 and uh, sailing to Byzantium. Uh, Byzantium is a uh, reference to the Eastern uh, Eastern Christendom uh, centered around uh, Byzantium or Constantinople. Um, and um, it's a place of a thousand year Christian civilization, eventually uh, destroyed uh, by the conquest of Islam. Um, and Yeats in this poem admires it as an artistic civilization. So Yeats is very much, um, although he alludes to Blake, uh, the romantic poet, Blake is not a natural, a nature poet in the same sense that Wordsworth is. He has, once again, his, a private mythology uh, and very much believes in the power of art uh, and not just in the power of nature. It's not that Wordsworth doesn't believe in the power of art either, but it's the it's the poetry of nature that uh, Wordsworth uh, evokes, whereas in Blake and in particularly in Yeats, uh, a far uh, stronger emphasis on, on artistry as opposed to nature here in his appeal to Byzantium. So Byzantine art, if you've seen it, is very stylized in its perspectives. So it's not realistic painting, it's not natural, very stylized. Um, and also it uh, is beautiful. Uh, mosaic, lots of different colors of, of, of stone. There's no attempt to be realistic in its portraiture of, of nature. So the animals also are, <coughs> are uh, uh, stylized and, and Blake sees this as an uh, ideal representation of an artistic culture. And, uh, and by the conclusion of the poem, wishes that his own body would even be transmuted into this sort of artificial uh, beauty which he himself is trying to create in his poetry. Um, it's called Sailing to Byzantium and it begins with a famous line, famous at any rate if you're aware of Hollywood uh, movies, that is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations, at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl, commend all summer long whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O oh, st sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, Come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal it knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form 
as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. So like uh, Easter 1916, here we have a four uh, stanza poem. Um, and once again, uh, something of alternating rhyme scheme. Uh, here it's uh, iambic, te te sorry, pentameter rather than tetrameter. Uh, but the rhyme scheme, uh, young trees, song, seas, long, dies, neglect, intellect, concludes with a rhyming couplet. Uh, and each of the stanzas concludes with a rhyming couplet, come and Byzantium, me and eternity and Byzantium and come. So it concludes with a tight finish, uh, the tight finish of the rhyming couplet, suggesting the, uh, the, the artistry of the poem uh, and the craftedness draws our attention to the poet's language in a way that uh, 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 lack of a rhyme would not do. Uh, and, and yet he doesn't, it's not rhyming couplet throughout, so it draws your attention to uh, the concluding lines, which finish each stanza. Uh, lots of mentions of, of uh, age and youth and the antithesis between the two. And he goes there and it's a place for the young, but it's the young who are lifeless or eternal. Um, I think we can hear the... Uh, echoes of Keats uh, ode uh, to a nightingale in this and a reference to the dying generations. Uh, also his uh, reference to the sensual music of the ode on a Grecian urn and in the portrait of the uh, uh, Grecian goldsmiths and so forth as well. He seems to be evoking some of the language about art of Keats's uh, two great uh, spring odes and I think uh, Many critics, myself included, think that both of those two poems uh, are about art and Keats's uh, understanding of what the poet's relation to good art is. And I think likewise here for Yeats, this is a poem uh, not just about sailing to Byzantium, but about uh, the relation of art to one's uh, poetic fame and final destiny. So I said references to age and youth uh, begins with the reference to that is no country for old men. And then in the second uh, stanza, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. The third stanza begins with old sages. The sages tend to be old uh, and not just old, but wise. Uh, and his reference to his body as a dying animal. Uh, it knows not what it is, he says. Uh, again, poetic echoes uh, in uh, the, that line. And then finally, the final stanza, once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. So he himself will be artistically represented rather than naturally represented. Again, it's his view of uh, the right uh, type of poetry, at least Yeats's idea of ideal poetry, which is less part of the romantic movement in the Wordsworthian mold and more in the beautiful imagistic uh, movement of probably by this point, the modernist movement. He was influenced by, uh, by uh, T.S. Eliot uh, and, uh, and also of um, uh, Ezra Pound. Uh, and you can see that here in the uh, sort of return to a sort of a classicism uh, of sorts, and yet using, again, very uh, sharp <clears throat> and striking imagery. Um, so lots of references to death and uh, mortality, but also immortality and the immortality of the, of the that's the product of the poet's uh, craft is the memory, not only of the poem, but of the poet who wrote it. So go back to the beginning, and I'll repeat what I said at the outset there, um, the young, so that is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations portrayed in art, they're, those are dying, but they're immortalized on the portrait of the Grecian urn. And here uh, 
uh, immortalized in uh, in the sensual music, uh, which all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. So he speaks to uh, in a deprecating fashion of the young, and in their uh, their uh, their delight and worship of of uh, the things of this world that die away and don't pass and have no eternal um, uh, resonance or eternal life. So those things um, are uh, things that Yeats uh, would leave behind in favor of poetic immortality, um, at, which are monuments of unaging intellect. So the youth contrasted here with the, uh, the wisdom of uh, the uh, intellect. And uh, speaking of the aged, the aged is but a paltry thing unless soul clap its wings and sing. So once again, I mentioned uh, uh, Madame Blavatsky uh, and her idea of universal oversoul. I think we can see some resonances of that here. Uh, and just as we saw it in the second coming as well. Uh, and unless soul clap its wings, not the soul, but soul, this universal soul, um, clapping its hands, almost biblical imagery, the trees, uh, and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress, nor is there singing school. So it's not something that... Um, but studying monuments of its own magnificence and therefore... The references as if something had been demonstrated causally here in this, but uh, it's more through uh, the language and the elusive use of words that he's made a statement here. Uh, but in order to study monuments of its own magnificence of the soul, therefore he has gone to Byzantium, which is the idealized portrait of an artistic uh, culture. Uh, for him, it's a holy city. And now he um, invokes those in the city who are uh, around the holy fire. Um, this is one of the rites of the Eastern Church, the holy fire. And O oh, sages standing in God's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall. Again, in, in Byzantine architecture, the walls are in, uh, often overlaid with gold foil, uh, great beauty, and it reflects the lights uh, meant to be a... A visual depiction of, of heaven in the same way that gold was uh, uh, laid inside the uh, the Jewish temple. Uh, but here it's in the mosaic. Uh, Come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. So the third line of the second stanza referred to soul in a universalized sense. Now it's his his individual soul. Be the singing masters, consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal. So that the soul, which is longing for eternal beauty and yet is, is uh, trapped in a mortal body uh, and a dying animal that doesn't even recognize the greatness of its soul. Um, uh, the line here, it knows not what it is. He's probably taken from Wordsworth's Immortality Ode echoing here the same theme of immortality as well. All that, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. And then once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. Again, a rejection of the naturalistic imagery of the Renaissance uh, and following, and certainly of the realism in favor of the modernist <coughs> more uh, more, uh, not just more aristocratic, but more uh, elite uh, idea of art fulfilling a certain function. And here again, alluding to Keats's great ode on a Grecian urn, his body will take such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make. So he imagines himself becoming a work of art, memorialized, such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and, and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake there as a museum piece, as it were, and yet speaking of a beauty that his poetry seeks to capture and memorialize. Uh, 
or set upon a golden bough, another image, to sing to lords and ladies of By Byzantium. Could be a reference to the nightingale uh, singing there, but the golden bough, of course, will be a reference to Sir James Fraser and his uh, compendium of, of uh, myths uh, from around the world. Uh, Fraser's A Golden Bow by this point had been published to much acclaim uh, and a great deal of interest to Yeats, of course. And The Golden Bow, if you recall from last semester from uh, Virgil's uh, Aeneid in the sixth book, uh, in order for um, uh, Aeneas to go down into the underworld to gain passage, even though he's a mortal man, he has to show uh, the Sharon, the uh, the uh, ferryman who will take him across the river to the realm of the undead. Um, he has to show him the golden bough to demonstrate that the gods have given him uh, their favor to do this, and he does this. So all of these are elusive um, and historical and classical uh, images which he's plucked from a variety of poems, but they have the same effect. He's going down to the realm of the dead, but he will also arise from it because he is uh, uh, he's immortalized through through art here. Uh, so either uh, a Grecian goldsmith's enameled uh, gold um, uh, covering inside the temple, or setting like a, a, sing, a singing songbird, like uh, Keats's Nightingale, singing uh, to the lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Uh, so the uh, concludes with the um, uh, ascendetic trichelon. Actually, it's not ascendetic. There's an or, or, or. Uh, passing or so uh, but but the three parts past passing or to come so there's a sense of hopefulness and uh, not just of death but of a uh, future manifestation a future uh, perfection in this so all these are part of Yeats's uh, poetic corpus um, I think three poems is sufficient to give you some flavor of the uh, manner of uh, Yeatsian imagery um, it's, it's highly evocative, it's highly beautiful, uh, it is elusive to past great works for the uh, careful reader, and, uh, and yet it ha has the marks of, uh, of careful artistry in a way that um, uh, poetry in the 20th century often does not. It starts to lose its form and uh, become more in the form of not just blank verse, but of no uh, versification at all. Um, and uh, Yeats is certainly not characteristic of that. And for my liking, uh, the greatest English language poet of the 20th century, uh, as well as the spokesman for a modern independent Ireland uh, and the imagery and the fusion uh, of history and culture uh, makes him uh, worthy of our study, and uh, we will conclude with that uh, and move on next time, I believe, to T.S. Eliot. Thank you.